Good day everybody, my name is Todd Standing. I'm the man who takes people out into the field and has them either live interact with our eyewitness Sasquatch. Thank you for tuning in for my Sasquatch Sunday video. So today I've got a, a big section of uh, footage, I guess you'd call it, of Jeff Meldrum, myself. Uh, just talking about my film, Discovering Bigfoot. At the time it was called Bigfoot North. So uh, I'm gonna play a little sequence of that that I cut together uh, a few years ago. Uh, for Discovery Channel and then uh, I'd like to go into something I haven't talked about in a long time which is the thermal footage of Sasquatch that I filmed so I call it, it's video 7 it's from my documentary uh, I'll take the segment out of that the documentary and show you that as as it was filmed a little bit of the backstory behind it you'll notice in, in the video that, that comes right after this John Bitternagel talks about how he saw my footage and heard the backstory and, and I explained him everything that happened and I'm going to start reviewing videos once in a while. I'm going to put that in the reviews before because I think that's so important with any, like there's this new Idaho Bigfoot footage and just lots of stuff that comes out. And, uh, you know, I, we have to get the whole story. We need to know what's going on behind the scenes. We need to know what was happening before and after and why you know the camera was there. Well, even I need to get a perspective to understand. Even it helps me why the Sasquatch was even... Because in something like the Idaho footage that I'm looking at, um, it's like the Sasquatch just blatantly showed himself. And there had to be a reason behind that. They don't just, you don't just accidentally sneak up on a Sasquatch like that. I'm sorry, guys. I mean, uh, Jeff Meldrum talked about it. I'm sure it does happen from time to time. But the, like in, in so many examples that I see, it's like the Sasquatch just has no place there. I don't understand what it's doing there. It doesn't make any sense for it to walk you know, out of the wilderness and into an open field with its back turned to a person. These things, I don't know, they're just, it's really preposterous when that stuff happens uh, without any backstory or explanation behind it. So that happened, see, and now the, the hypocrisy comes up. You go, well, didn't that happen to Jeff Meldrum? Yes, but the Sasquatch showed himself to Jeff Meldrum. He did it on purpose. He was testing us. There were other Sasquatch around. So that's the backstory that's so absolutely essential because they do do that. They will expose themselves and purposely show themselves to somebody. But there has to be a damn good reason for it. And there was, in that case, there was a really good reason. He was testing us. He was showing himself to us. And they'd taken apples. They were interacting with us. All, and I'd been doing research there for, you know, years preemptively. So they, were, they knew me and they were comfortable with me. So this wasn't some just random happening. So uh, anyways, I'll let you watch this, uh, this little section of uh, some cool footage. I'm very honored and proud to, have, to, to work with Jeff Meldrum to this day at times and to have worked with John Benernagel um, in the last years of his life. Uh, he was an amazing colleague and friend and mentor of mine. Uh, I, I love the man to death. I have nothing but amazing things to say about him. They broke the mold when they made that man. He was an absolute gentleman. So you'll see some stuff from him here. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come back in a minute. So in the meantime, just enjoy this footage. I've been able to see for the first time uh, some complete segments of Todd Standing's filming of Sasquatch in another, in another area where he's worked on and with him explaining the background, which is so important. And uh, I'm firmly convinced that he has filmed Sasquatches and that he has, what he has portrayed in his documentary are indeed very close portraits, in fact of the Sasquatch face. Because if indeed they are, they are clearly some of the most astounding photos of, uh, of Sasquatch in existence. With all the 10, 20 years of tracking and experience I have in the wilderness, there's no way that those structures happen randomly. Mm -hmm. There's no way that you got sight of a Sasquatch in those areas with those tree breaks, with those tracks, getting those apples taken, with those sounds, all these things. For the past 10 years, I've been conducting expeditions, documenting chronicles, and interviewing people pertaining to the subject of Sasquatch. With over 20 years worth of hardcore backcountry expedition experience into the most remote regions, I've tracked and studied various North American species that have had little to no exposure to civilization. I am a student of many disciplines, trained in the art of tracking by a Cree Nation's elder and a military sniper my skill sets include camouflage techniques using the terrain and its features to mask ground movement, obstacle crossing, camping positions, effective observation, camouflage penetration, counter surveillance, survival evasion, and escape techniques. 
In 2006, my team and I publicly showed two separate crystal clear Bigfoot videos I personally filmed, which we used to petition the Canadian government for species protection of Bigfoot. The petition was certified and tabled in the Canadian House of Commons. The media response was enormous, with hundreds of newspaper, television networks, radio stations, and websites that receptively presented our work across the globe. It was our goal to reach out to the masses about why our group was beginning the struggle for species recognition and protection. I must say that uh, sitting and watching these videos in contrast to still images, the still images that I was familiar with before we've gotten acquainted here personally, um, especially that video of the, the, the devil as you refer to him, the dark faced uh, individual, uh, I, I, I can't look at that image and not feel that I'm looking into the eyes of a living creature. And, uh, and yeah, that's very exciting. I mean, that's, as, as I said, it, uh, I've often imagined what it would feel like to actually gaze into the face of a Sasquatch eventually, if I'd ever had that privilege. And uh, I must say that that experience of, of watching that film on the laptop was as close to that experience, I think, as, as I've had. It's Sasquatch. Believe it, know it, live it. It's the truth. They're here. They know about us. They're aware of us. They think that they're communicating with us. And we're just not getting it. And that's why I'm trying to get species protection and recognition and trying to get primatologists to stop going all the bloody way to Africa when you have bipedal, man-like primates currently residing right here on the continent of North America. And they're exceptionally intelligent and they're an amazing, incredible, unbelievable, spectacular miracle of species. And that's why we don't recognize it. Because it's too amazing, it's too miraculous, it's too much of a big deal. Time to take our heads out of the sand and recognize this incredible primate species and start learning from them because the masters of civilization, my people, sure could learn a lot from the masters of the wilderness, which is who they are. So my goal, my dream, is to take some thermal cameras, uh, put them on blimp drones, float them around my research area, and follow the Sasquatch. Ideally, tube drones would be amazing, but I'm at this point after trying to make this come together and, and work this out for, gosh, since 2014, really. Uh, I'm just gonna take whatever I can get at this point, because uh, you need, you would need to have there are drones that like I have drones that can just fly around they make a lot of noise and uh, I could probably get a thermal camera that could get some I don't even know if that would work out to be honest I, I think I'd just be a, a shot in the dark at best but it's a blimp drone that I would need with a thermal camera in my area so what you need to have success with that is first you need to have Sasquatch come around and someone who I can identify the Sasquatch which is me you have to have terrain that you can continuously observe them and where I live Rocky Mountain Douglas firs are everywhere. They're the dominant species. We also have pine and spruce trees, but it's almost like 95% Rocky Mountain Douglas fir. They are useless for hiding heat signatures. They literally are pine needles and they're triangular shaped. So uh, it would be, I hate to say it, but it would be fairly easy to follow them around that way. Quiet drones floating above them. Because even in the remote areas that I go to, once in a while you hear airplanes going over and whatnot. And I think just a, a blimp drone floating over top would be something that the Sasquatch would at the very least learn to tolerate possibly 
But uh, so that's my goal. It's still my goal. It was, it's was it been my goal for a long time. I haven't been able to achieve it just because of the finances. I was hoping to have tremendous financial success with Discovering Bigfoot the movie, um, but that never really precipitated the way I wanted it to. Literally, I was thinking in terms of, as an example, I know an episode of Finding Bigfoot was about $400,000. So I know that my documentary certainly stood up to the very least that. I mean, I have PhDs in it. They're eyewitnessing a Sasquatch and substantiating my work. And I have fo photographs and footage of Sasquatch, like Finding Bigfoot has never gotten in their wildest dreams. And it's two hours of movie, so I was hoping for $800,000. That would have been enough to clearly get the research that I, that I want done, but it, that hasn't precipitated yet. But still, a goal of mine. In the meantime, we work and continue to be very grateful for the success that we're garnering at this time. And having amazing years as we move forward. So here's a little sequence from... Uh, my movie Discovering Bigfoot and uh, I'll talk about some stuff at the end of it So we're just gonna go into uh, video 7, which was the first and only time I've ever filmed a Sasquatch thermally uh, Very proud of this footage. So uh, have a watch at this sequence again What I always try to do is talk about what happened before and, and then in my movie I go into what happened after we'll stop at before and the footage for for this video But uh, have a look at that and we'll come back for it You know the camera will never pick it up Right now, there's a Sasquatch moving back behind me, nice and slow. He's letting me know he's there, though. He doesn't have to do that. This whole boom, 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 boom. It's intimidation, and it should work. I'm being followed by, you know, probably a 700-pound primate chasing me. I wonder if the bugs are getting him too. When returning from my Sasquatch expeditions to base camp, most of the time at least two individuals follow me out of the habitat. Right now you can hear a squirrel off in the distance. He is not squawking at me. Foraging for food this way in open areas is a behavior I learned from primatologists like Diane Fossey. The goal is to show these primates a behavior they recognize as calm. The more they relax in my presence, the closer they get to me. And these particular individuals are very, very close. For years, I've always exited this habitat the exact same way. They expect me to follow the same path and the same speed, and that's exactly what I've been doing. All the while waiting for that cue to one day turn around with the hope of getting closer. Fortunately for me, this day, I heard that cue. It was a call out like nothing I'd ever heard before, and it happened at the perfect time in the perfect place. I quickly moved into position. There's a blind spot up there. I jumped into and waited. It seemed to be working. I could hear them approaching very closely. I panned around with my 50 times optical zoom camera and could hear this individual was very close. But I could see nothing. Several minutes passed with no success. So in an act of desperation, I turned on my thermal camera. Fortunately, the conditions were perfect. Within seconds, I could see something. And there it was. An image so shocking to me, I instinctively took two steps back. Clearly, less than 60 yards away from me was a very large heat signature. This signature was about 20 yards up a pine tree that had no branches. Only a black bear or a young grizzly could elicit this behavior. Certainly no human being could do this. Here, any possibility of this image being any known species is gone from my mind. This Sasquatch is holding itself up at times with one arm. He in fact looks very comfortable as he's waiting for me to emerge from the bottom of the mountain. Shocked by what I'm witnessing, I quietly reposition myself. After nearly a decade of work, this is the first time I've ever filmed a Sasquatch thermally or in a tree.
I momentarily film my hand temperature as a heat reference. At this point, this primate becomes aware of where I'm actually located as the other Sasquatch begins to protest to my far right. Now as I move to reposition, my goal becomes filming this individual in motion on the ground. I did not see... Here's some brand new information that I've never talked about before, ever. So I had a, uh, there were a couple PhDs that have not gone public that were working with me. And uh, what happened was that day, you'll see that Sasquatch was moving his arm around. What happened was, the reason I heard that sound was he went to climb that tree and he caught his arm bad on a broken branch on one side. I guess he was flying up the tree and he ripped his arm really hard and a big chunk of skin came off of him. I collected that skin. So I had a little piece of Sasquatch skin. So when I went up and over there, he easily moved off. In fact, what happened precisely was as I moved towards him, I, I couldn't, uh, he kind of got behind the tree. I could just see the outsides of him thermally like his shoulders and he just dropped. I just suddenly saw like a light, a red line go down and boom. He literally looks like without exaggeration dropped 30 feet down and her boom, really powerful boom on the ground because his feet landed and then he just moved off very easily and evaded me. But when I got there, I saw only maybe 10 feet off the bottom of the tree, that big piece of, you know, skin hanging there. It looked like, uh, looked like tree lichen, but I could see a fleshy part of it and there was like a, a bit of blood on it. So I climbed up there. I took the time, went and climbed up there, put that piece in a, in a plastic bag that I had and, uh, and kept it for years until, uh, someone, again, I don't like getting to conspiracy crap, but, uh, there was a point where somebody broke into my house and stole, uh, tons of evidence like that. But, uh, don't really want to get into that stuff now because you know what it doesn't matter because I'll, I'll, I had DNA I had DNA analyzed um, what was analyzed about that big chunk of uh, skin that had hair on it is it was hair and the follicles are big and long and we got to understand hair is gorillas chimpanzees orangutans and human beings everything else has fur or feathers just not hair we are highly unique in that primates have actual hair so seeing that Sasquatch up a tree and then hearing that sound and that sound was, ah, that, that was, it was ouch. And then being able to gather that piece of evidence. And I was even able to gather that evidence because I, I, I moved towards him and he backed off. So I don't know if, if, if under those circumstances, and I went straight to that exact tree. So without all those circumstances have circumstances having transpired, I, I don't think I would have gathered that. So, uh, but that's, that's how you, that's how you get stuff is you're out there and you're consistent. And, and I know my expeditioners are watching this going, man, that's exactly what we do. We move around, the Sasquatch are around us, they make noise, we're, we hear the squirrels chirp. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, and, and at that time, I was never taking expeditioners out. And now that I do, they're seeing those same behaviors. So if you look at this and go, ah, oh, it's crap, it's not. I have dozens of expeditioners now that will substantiate these precise things are happening. In fact, Sometimes on some expeditions, they're like wood knocking and banging trees and they're much louder than they, than they are. They were being very subtle at times with me where I could hear branches breaking and um, just, just being very subtle about, you know, stepping and the boom, boom, boom would only be usually just that three times. And since then, again, if you're watching my videos, you know that the Sasquatch are introducing themselves and they go boom, boom, boom. So they call themselves the boom, but, uh, Anyways, that's my Sasquatch Sunday stuff. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this stuff. There'll be lots more great stuff to come. So uh, um, I have my Wednesday live shows. There's a, my Throwback Thursday. It'll be really cool this week. Just I'm putting a lot of work in these videos. My YouTube channel really, really matters to me. So I'll keep working hard on it. And uh, in the meantime, if you actually care and this discovery is really important to you, you can go to my Patreon page, Todd Sanding Patreon, or you can go to my website, discoveringbigfoot.org, and make a donation because I am a full-time Sasquatch researcher. All this is done, the movie is done, the videos are done, all this is done to help move and facilitate this discovery to move forward. If you're passionate about this discovery, make donations, help out with if you can afford it, if it's easy, if it's easy for you and if it's something that's very important to you and you're passionate about. People support gorilla research, people support the whales and I think that's wonderful. Um, I think a great deal of my subscribers are very passionate about this discovery and we work very, very hard for it. It matters to us and every donation you, you make uh, makes a big difference. So thank you very much for tuning in and uh, I'll see you on Wednesday in my live show. Until then, take care.